So, viewers, today I am going to take you through hand examination. Now, hand is a very important part of the body and it provides a lot of useful function for our day to day activities. Now, even a slight loss of function can pose a lot of challenge uh, when we do our day to day activities. So, for me, hand is one of the most important part of the body and a thorough assessment is extremely important so that you are able to diagnose those conditions properly and treat them appropriately so that you don't have any disability in future. Now for me hand is an organ because hand does a lot of useful things. For example, it is used for grasping things. If I want to grasp this stamp or if I want to hold a pen, I think hand is the most important part of the body in doing these functions. Now it is also a sensory organ because even if I have my eyes closed, and I can tell uh, even when my eyes are closed that what I'm holding in my hand. For example, whether I'm holding a coin, I'm holding a pen, I'm holding a paper. Um, so you can tell actually even without uh, opening your eyes. So that provides a lot of sensory and tactile feedback for our day-to-day -day activities. Now it is also used as an organ of expression, you know, in your day-to-day -day activities when uh, say for example, you're upset and uh, you're kid is misbehaving and if when you point this that means you're angry or if you point a fist that means um, you, you convey your uh, expression sometimes through hand as well. So that is why for me it is an organ. So today my aim is to take you through thoroughly through hand examination so that you feel confident in diagnosing common conditions and you can treat them appropriately so that there is no functional disability. So history plays a very important role in most of the examination. So uh, I talk about taking a thorough history. Now hand is quite special to me. Um, so if certain things which should be part and parcel of the history is first thing is the age. Now age plays a very important role. Uh, the reason I talk about age is that the same injury in an elderly would be treated separately or differently to a person who is young. So hand, uh, we try not to operate unless we have to. So slight loss of functional uh, function in an elderly may be acceptable but may not be acceptable in a young patient. Now, occupation is also important so you should always ask what does the patient do. So the same injury could be treated differently in a computer operator than uh, if somebody is a laborer because a small loss of function for a laborer man might not be uh, disabling or might not matter a lot but the same loss of function may matter a lot for a computer operator or a musician um, who needs a fine finger movements. Now hobbies is also uh, becoming extremely important these days. People love to come, uh, you know, uh, do their hobbies after the injury. So uh, you, it can also influence the treatment. Now hand dominance, whether somebody is right-handed or left-handed, you should always ask. Um, again, the reason is sometimes if uh, the injury is affecting a non-dominant hand and especially if the patient is elderly then I tend to treat them uh, less aggressively. Now once you have moved on then the most common time the reason the patient will present is pain. Now pain you should drill the pain quite well first of all you should ask you know the duration of pain you know all those headings of the pain that where is the pain um, you know what makes the pain better what makes the pain worse so drill pain uh, thoroughly because that will help you reach your differential diagnosis and eventually your uh, final diagnosis as well. The other common uh, thing that you will see in hand is uh, swelling. So again nature of the swelling, where is the swelling, uh, does it get big or small, if it changes size you will see ganglion uh, is a typical uh, swelling that can change size. So once it becomes big and sometimes you will see the patient will say that you know it's becoming smaller. So if you have swelling, find out where the swelling is and that will help you to reach your diagnosis as well. Uh, the other common uh, things that will affect hand is, you know, the nerve pathologies. So whether it's proximal nerve pathologies or C-spine problem or distal nerve pathologies such as carpal tunnel will manifest in form of uh, pins and needles or tingling. So ask uh, about the numbness, you know, where is the tingling, whether they have neck pain in order to localize uh, where the problem is and you will be able to come to a diagnosis uh, when you do an examination whether it's a carpal tunnel or a cubital tunnel or whether it's a c-spine lesion or it's a combination of lesion now sometimes patient will report color changes or hot and cold feeling that can uh, 
uh, point towards a vascular cause. Uh, so drill history appropriately. Uh, occasionally, patient will report deformities, you know, where, and catching. So if patient reports catching uh, when they are opening or closing the fist, that's a typical history that you will see uh, in a trigger finger. And uh, deformities uh, could be due to nerve injuries or could be due to burns or could be due to deputrins. So drill uh, take a lot of time in uh, taking a proper history because a lot of times only the history when you take a thorough history will come to a diagnosis. So take a thorough history when you are doing a hand examination. So once you have done your hand examination, now the first thing that I talk about is, you know, how much exposure do you need for doing a proper hand examination. So for me, if I'm examining the hand, I should be able to see the hand completely. I should be able to see the forearm completely and I should be able to see the elbow completely. So uh, like if you look at my hand, this is the bare minimum uh, that I would like to uh, see when I'm doing my hand examination. So I should be able to see the elbow, I should be able to see the forearm and I should be able to see the hand. If you have any jewelry or any rings which is coming in your way when you're examining it, you can ask the patients to remove it uh, so that your examination is not hampered because by their presence. So once you have uh, done, uh, taken a thorough history and if you have exposed the patient well, then next thing you move on is uh, for look. Uh, that will be the first part of your examination. Uh, but before you do the look, um, uh, what I like to do is what we call is a screening of the hand. So lest if the patient is coming to you, ask them to put your hands like this. And first thing I want you to notice is the natural cascade of the fingers. So if you see here, this is the normal resting position of a normal hand. So if you see my uh, little finger, this is more flexed than um, the ring finger. Ring finger is more flexed than the long finger and the long finger is uh, more flexed than the index finger. So there is a natural cascade and this is normal. So you want to appreciate whether this cascade is present or not. If there is any disruption in cascade, say for example, if the middle finger is in this position. Now this tells me that the cascade is disturbed. Now this finger is more extended than these fingers. So that if somebody has got a laceration here, then that will tell me that there is a very good chance that the flexor tender injury uh, is there. And because the extensors are overpowering, then there is a loss of cascade. Similarly, if there are two fingers which are like this, then if you have a big laceration, that will tell you that there might be injury to flexor tendons of both the hands. Now, on the other hand, if the finger was more flexed like this, if I try to show it like this, now if you see the middle finger is more flexed. So again, there is disruption of the natural cascade, but it is opposite to what we saw a few minutes ago. And what it tells me, now the flexors are more overpowering. Now, if somebody has got a laceration here or here across the extensor tendon, then there is a very high likelihood chance that there is an extensor tendon injury and that is the reason the cascade of the finger is disturbed. Now once you have uh, looked at the cascade of the fingers, the second thing you want to do is to ask the rough screening. So ask patient to open and close hand. So open and close hand. If they are able to do this, then functionally they should be able to do something. If there is an interruption in this, then it can point towards a particular uh, differential diagnosis. So this is what I do. Once you have done the screening, you have looked at the cascade, you have asked to flex and extend, then you move on to the skin. So you want to see the skin in the front and in the back. And what you're looking for is uh, looking for any scars, whether there is any uh, old heel scar, whether there is a new lacerated wound or if there is any wound in front or back, if there is any erythema, or there is loss of uh, shiny or skin is shiny. All these things are uh, extremely important. Whether there is any skin changes, you know, or if uh, one hand is uh, looking paler than the other hand, or if there is a lot of redness, these are the things that you look uh, to start with. When you're examining the skin, you also look for the nails. Now, nails are extremely important because sometimes rare diagnosis, such as glomus tumor, and I have seen two or three in my lifetime, you will see 
uh, ridging of the nail or nail being deformed. Um, and if patient is complaining of pain there and there is deformity, then think of glomus tumor. If there is pitting of the nail and if the patient has got pain in the large joints or in the small joints, that can point towards the psoriatic um, arthropathy. Now, the second thing you move on is swelling. So, notice for any swelling. Now, the common swelling that you will see in hand are ganglions. So, ganglion can present across the wrist, which I have covered in the wrist examination video. You can have ganglion in the back as well. Now, the other uncommon swelling are you can have, you know, giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath. They can also present as swelling in the hand. Now, nodules of sometimes if you see swelling in the hand and across the palm and pitting, those swelling or nodules are usually related to Deputin's disease. You can have sometimes inclusion cyst uh, which can present uh, across uh, the fingers or, or retinacular cyst, uh, they can present there. Now, uncommon swelling uh, can be lipoma, neuroma or fibroma, but they are not very common in hands. Now, the other swelling that you will see are usually related to arthritis. So, if you notice swelling of the distant phalangeal joint, then it is a habitant node. And if you notice a swelling across the proximal interphalangeal joint, then it is the Bouchard nodes. So, see the swelling uh, when you are inspecting. So, these are the commonest swelling that you will see. Now, once you have a uh, look at the skin, you have seen for any swelling, then I move on to any muscle wasting. Now, the muscle wasting that you need to look for is this thenar muscles, which are supplied by median nerve, these hypothenar muscles, which are supplied by uh, ulnar nerve, also these small muscles of the hand, especially the first dorsal interosei, which is also supplied by the ulnar nerve. Now, if there is any wasting of thenar muscles, especially abductor pollicis brevis here and the wasting you appreciate more when you look at this. So, develop a habit of looking at the swelling in this form and in this form. So, in this way you will be able to appreciate minor wasting and that can point towards um, uh, the median nerve pathology. A lot of times you will see wasting of the thinner muscles if somebody has got severe degenerative changes at base of thumb and that is because of the lack of use. So, these are um, so, you look for the wasting of thenar muscles. Similarly, you look for wasting for hypothenar muscles and that can point towards the ulnar nerve pathology as I said before. So, when you have wasting of uh, hypothenar muscle and if somebody has got wasting uh, of some forearm muscles and has got positive tenel at the elbow, that can suggest towards the ulnar nerve pathology. Now, other thing that you also need to look when you are looking for ulnar pathology is a uh, wasting of the first dorsal interosei. So, if you look at both my hands, if I adduct my thumb together, you will see uh, this is my dominant hand. So, that is why this is more prominent. Here, it is less prominent, but there is no wasting. So, if I show you in this profile, this muscle is first dorsal interosei. If you see any wasting uh, of this muscle, then that indicates towards uh, ulnar nerve involvement. Also, in advanced stages, you will see guttering. So, if you have uh, guttering of these uh, uh, metacarpals or in between metacarpals, then that also indicates towards the ulnar nerve uh, pathology. Now, so these are the things that I would look for um, wasting uh, in terms of thinner and hypothenar muscles, which will give me an indication towards any nerve problems. Now, once you have uh, looked at uh, the atrophy of the muscles for looking for any cause of nerve involvement or other causes that may lead to the wasting of these muscles, then you move on to the deformity. Now, deformity, the three commonest deformities that I would uh, like to um, talk about uh, first is the swan neck deformity, uh, the swan and butinous deformity and the mallet deformity. Now, swan neck deformity, if I show, try to show it in my finger, uh, I'm not that flexible, but swan neck deformity usually has got hyper extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint and flexion at the distant interphalangeal joint. And this is usually seen in somebody who has got a volar plate injury. So, swan neck deformity I will, uh, is hyperextension at the proximal interphalangeal joint and flexion at the distant interphalangeal joint. Now, the second deformity is called butinous deformity. So, it will present something like this where there is flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint 
and extension or hyper extension at the distant phalangeal joint. So if I show you in this profile, this is how it will manifest. Now central slip is uh, commonly injured but uncommonly appreciated. Now when I was a trainee resident, I missed once a central slip injury and I treated her with a buddy strapping and three weeks later that girl came with a botanous deformity. And that was the last time I missed a central slip injury. So I have uploaded a separate video on Elsen test. So do learn what Elsen test is and I will cover this in this video as well. So any injury in this area, don't take it lightly. It might be central slip injury. So this is the botanous deformity. Now the last thing, uh, the last deformity, that the common deformity is what we call a mallet deformity. So mallet deformity will present something like this if I show you in this profile. So there is only flexion at distant phalangeal joints. So flexion could be mild, it could be you know a bit more or it could be quite a lot. So this is mallet deformity. This is usually due to either rupture of extensor tendon or stretching of extensor tendon or sometimes a bony mallet due to a small bony avulsion in the back. So these three deformities are extremely common and I have shown you what to see in these deformities. Now the other common deformity that you might see is what we call a clawing and I will cover that later in this video as well. So clawing will present something uh, like this. So if in this there will be extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint and there will be flexion of proximal as well as the distant phalangeal joint. Now other uh, causes may also lead to uh, deformity such as deputrance, such as burns, such as uh, post-traumatic contracture. I will cover that later in my video in the detail. Now the last thing uh, if somebody has got history of trauma and is complaining of pain across the metacarpals, what I do is, what I would advise you is to see your metacarpal in a tangential profile. So if you see my hand metacarpal in tangential profile, you can see that I want you to focus on my uh, ring finger. So if you see metacarpal head on my left hand is far more prominent than this side. So focus here, this is flat and on this side you can see that it is not that flat and the reason is because I broke this metacarpal while playing cricket and this is healed by slight shortening. So any shortening of the metacarpal will manifest itself in form of flattening of the knuckles. So if you can ask somebody um, to just do this and look at it tangentially, you will be easily able to diagnose boxer's fracture or fracture of the metacarpals and if you compare it with the normal side, you will see flattening. So this is the last thing I will do before I move on to the palpation. Once you have uh, done your uh, inspection, then you move on to uh, the field part of uh, the examination. So the first thing you can do is look for any local temperature. If there is any raise in local temperature, that could uh, suggest inflammatory or infective pathology. Now, a lot of pathologies um, of um, the hand Oh, sorry, of wrist are covered in my wrist examination video, so I'm not covering those areas. But in terms of palpation, it's always a good practice to ask the patient where is the pain and come to the painful area in the end. But in essence, you look for palpation of each individual um, bones and look for any tenderness. So you look for metacarpal, proximal interphalangeal joint, distant interphalangeal joint, and you do it, do it very systematically so that you don't miss out anything. Same for thumb, you can examine the base of thumb, IPJ, uh, proximal uh, phalanx, interphalangeal joint and distal phalanx. So go systematically. Uh, sometimes if patient gives history of uh, triggering, uh, then you can feel the individual even pulley and see if the patient is complaining of any tenderness uh, there and you can always sometimes feel a nodule. At part of the palpation, good practice to feel for both radial as well as ulnar artery. Now, because I am already feeling for radial as well as ulnar artery, if at all I have any doubts about any vascular cause, I would do a um, Allen's test at this point of time. So let me tell you what Allen test is. So if you're doing an Allen test uh, as a part of uh, feel, you feel for radial pulse, you feel for ulnar pulse, you keep the hand supinated, and once uh, you feel for both radial and ulnar pulse, just obliterate them and ask patient to open and close hand few times. And once 
and the hand is completely white then you release at the time i have released radial artery so you can see the hand is becoming red that tells me that the radial artery is functioning very well same way i will repeat it and then i will release my ulnar artery and then hand will go pink so this will tell me about patency of uh, both radial as well as ulnar artery usually in majority of the patients ulnar artery is the main artery uh, to the hand at this point of time i will also check for sensation at tip of the index finger or median nerve tip of the little finger for ulnar nerve and first web space for any uh, radial nerve uh, involvement um, in part of palpation you can also feel for any obvious uh, cords which can be uh, present in uh, deputrans um, such as a spiral cord nitrotri cord or commissural cord which is seen uh, in between the index and the thumb so that would be uh, my palpation uh, complete so once you have uh, done the palpation or feel part of the examination then we move on to the movements so let's first focus the metacarpophalangeal joint so if you see metacarpophalangeal joint is uh, bending roughly up to 90 degrees so this is the maximum flexion so it's measured bending up to 90 degrees but it's it hyper extends so finger can go backwards if you can see this is hyper extension so even if the finger can be extended up to neutral that also means that we have lost some extension so metacarpophalangeal joint is from almost minus 40 to roughly 90 degree of flexion so now let's focus on uh, proximal interphalangeal joints if you see i can extend so the movement of proximal interphalangeal joint is from 0 to if you can see this this is 90 this is going past 90 so roughly around 100 degrees of flexion so if i show you the movement of the dipj so dipj again can extend up to 0 degrees but if you talk about flexion it flexes if i show you in this profile some fingers will uh, bend up to 90 degrees some fingers will bend up to uh, 80 to 90 degrees so 80 to 90 degrees of flexion is normal range of motion of distant phalangeal joint so now if i talk about uh, movement at metacarpophalangeal joint of thumb so it hyper extends slightly uh, maybe around minus 10 uh, degrees and then if you flex it uh, it flexes if this is the profile so if this is metacarpal if you can see it's flexing to roughly around uh, 45 to 55 degrees of flexion now if you look at the interphalangeal joint interphalangeal joint in my case hyper extends but it's not always the case some people it will be just about neutral some people it will hyper extend in some people it will hyper extend more than others so always compare the other side if uh, uh, the other side is uninjured and in terms of flexion again you can see you can flex it up to around 80 to 90 degrees so in terms of movements of the hand uh, the fingers usually flex and extend they also abduct and adduct so you can check these uh, movements now in terms of uh, movement of of thumb the thumb movement is slightly more complex so finger flexion is this finger e extension is this finger abduction is this and finger adduction is this now in terms of uh, movement of the thumb finger flexion is this finger extension is this finger adduction or ab is this finger abduction is this opposition is again touching the other fingers and if you move you can circumduct so these are the movements of the thumb so once you have done this uh, basic examination now i will move on to the specific pathologies as how to um, identify these specific pathologies so when we talk about specific pathologies let's talk first about the flexors of the hand so when we talk about uh, the tendons or the muscles uh, which are involved in movement of the hand now they are usually of two types so uh, there will be um, muscles which will come from proximally will cross across the wrist and they will be inserted 
onto the various parts of the hand. These muscles are called extrinsic muscles. Now there are other muscles which will take origin within the hand and will be inserted within the hand. These are called intrinsic muscles of the hand. So the first muscle or first muscle that I would like to cover, uh, let's cover the extrinsic muscle and we will start with flexor distorum profundus. Now flexor distorum profundus originates uh, and comes as uh, individual uh, muscle belly and then it crosses the wrist, then it crosses the metacarpophalangeal joint, it crosses the proximal interphalangeal joint and then subsequently it crosses the distal interphalangeal joint and is inserted at the base of the distal phalanx. Now if you talk about the function, the primary function of this FDP or flexor distorum profundus is to bend the distant phalangeal joint. But because it is crossing all these joints, when it functions, it will also function as flexor of proximal interphalangeal joint, subsequently of metacarpal interphalangeal joint and subsequently of the wrist as well. So it is also a wrist flexor but a very weak one. So if somebody has got injury to its flexor distorum profundus, so how should we diagnose? So if somebody has got injury to the FDP, then how shall we um, diagnose it? So if you want to diagnose um, the FDP injury, what you have to do is to immobilize. I, I usually put my hand, my index finger over the proximal phalanx and distal, uh, sorry, middle finger over the middle phalanx and I ask the patient to bend. So if you can see, this patient is able to bend this uh, just at uh, the tip. That means the FDP of the um, long finger is pretty good. Same way, ring finger, same way, index finger and same way ring finger. Now analogous to FDP in thumb is um, the flexor pollicis longus. So if you ask them to bend the tip, this means the F, uh, flexor pollicis longus in thumb is working well. So the second tendon that I would like to cover is FDS, that is flexor distorum superficialis. So if you ask somebody to bend the finger, then you cannot be sure whether FDS is intact or not. The function of FDS is to bend the middle uh, or the proximal interphalangeal joint. However, because as I said, FDP also crosses this joint, it acts as a secondary flexor for this. So what we need to do is, we need to eliminate the function of FDP. So I'll show you how to do it. So what you want to do is, uh, because uh, they work uh, together, so you want to eliminate FDP uh, or FDP. So what you do is that you hyperextend the distal interphalangeal joint like this so that any function of FDP is completely eliminated. So you hyperextend. Uh, if at all, if you don't want to hyperextend, you can at least put it and then ask the patient to bend. So if I show you in a uh, volunteer, uh, if you can, if I'm testing the middle finger, bend the middle finger, that means the FDS to this finger is working fine. If I want to check uh, the ring finger, so that's fine. If I want to check the index finger, that's fine. And lastly this, so now he's not able to bend his little finger uh, proximal interphalangeal joint. And this is, and this can be normal because 15% of the patient will have either absent or a rudimentary uh, FDS to the little finger. So if I show you my hand, I am able to bend it. However, uh, my volunteer was not able to bend because of presence of a rudimentary or absent FDS. So this is extremely important. Don't be, uh, this can, what I want to say is that if there is no flexion at proximal interphalangeal joint, it can be normal in 15% of the patients if it is just uh, the little finger. So once you have assessed your flexor distorum profundus and flexor distorum superficialis and flexor pollicis longus, I think two extrinsic uh, muscles which are important is uh, flexor carpi ulnaris on the ulnar side and flexor carpi radialis on the radial side. Now as I said before, because FDP and FDS, they both cross the wrist joint, and they can be a weak uh, flexor of the wrist. So if they are able to do some wrist flexion, and that doesn't mean that uh, the FD, um, the flexor carpi ulnaris and radialis are intact. 
So in order to assess this, how do you assess? So it's extremely easy. Uh, you ask patient to palmar flex. So if you just ask patient to palmar flex, and then you feel FCU, you will feel bow stringing there, and you will also feel bow stringing there. So this bow stringing is next to the ulnar uh, radial artery, and the, this big thick tendon that you can see is flexor carpi radialis, and this one you cannot see. Uh, it is flexor carpi ulnaris. Now flexor carpi ulnaris is attached to the base of uh, fifth uh, metacarpal. Uh, radialis is attached on second and third. So the other option is to just uh, put your hand on second and third metacarpal and ask them to bend. This becomes more prominent and same way here, put your hand on fifth metacarpal and ask them. If you can feel these bow stringing, that means these tendons are intact. So the last tendon, which is also an extensic muscle is palmaris longus. Uh, usually uh, it's not of uh, great functional importance, but it can be extremely useful tendon in tendon transfers. Um, the easiest way, um, because it att attaches onto the palmar fascia, if you ask the patient to cup, you will see this tendon, which is prominent. This is palmaris longus. Now, it is absent in around 10 to 15 percent of normal population. So, on my subject today is one of the um, junior residents here. If I ask him to cup, you can see there's nothing is coming up. So he's the same uh, student in which the FDS for the little finger was also absent and his palmaris longus is also absent. So we have now examined uh, the extrinsic, that is all the flexors extrinsic uh, of uh, the hand. Now we move on to intrinsics. Now intrinsic, most uh, uh, people will think in, usually involves uh, uh, your introsi, both dorsal and palmar and lumbricals. However, as I said before in my description that all muscles which originate and insert within the hand are intrinsic. So that will include muscles of uh, thinar and hypothenar muscles. So we'll cover as how to examine them. So now lumbricals, they originate from uh, FDP from the radial side. And uh, similarly, dorsal and palmar interosci, they originate from uh, the metacarpals and they all um, attach on this extensive hood. So as the function of these two intrinsics, what they do is they flex the metacarpophalangeal joint and they extend the interphalangeal joint. So this is, so this function, if I show you like this, this, this function is being done by intrinsic. Now we also know that intrinsics are also responsible for abduction as well as adduction of the <coughs> fingers. So how to test them? Now, whenever you want to test the intrinsics, uh, you always should put your hand flat on a flat surface. And the reason I say this is because the all long flexors, uh, which are extrinsic, they are adductors. So they are adductors. And the reason they are, if I show you, if I ask you to make a fist with finger abducted, you will see that you are struggling. As you close it, you as you adduct and close, you are able to close it much more easily. So the long extrinsic flexors are adductors. So that is why you cannot make a fist with finger abducted. Similarly, when you extend the fingers, the extrinsics on the back, those are extensors, they are abductors. So secondarily, as you will extend, fingers will automatically abduct. But if you want to extend your fingers with fingers together, you will have to work hard. I am really struggling. I, I will ask you to just try it on your own. So extrinsics, extensors are abductors. So just to eliminate these functions of long flexors of extrinsics as well as uh, long uh, extensors which are extrinsics is to ask the patient to spread the um, hand, put the hand on the flat surface and abduct and adduct. You can do it uh, actively, you can do it against the resistance. One thing you will see is as you abduct and adduct, everything is moving except for the middle finger. So to check the middle finger, you ask middle finger to be moved separately. And this is how you uh, examine the intrinsics of the hand.
Now the other intrinsics uh, which are left are the muscles of the thenar muscles and hypothenar muscles. Now uh, the hypothenar muscles and thenar muscles, um, they have an abductor, they have a flexor and they have a one small muscle for opposition, each of them. Now to check the muscle on the thenar uh, side, um, usually what you are assessing is assessing the function of uh, the motor branch, rectal motor branch which originates. So, Usually, if you bend your index finger, sorry, ring finger, where it touches the thenar muscles, usually is the site where you will find um, the motor branch is originating. Or you can draw a vertical line from your first or se sorry second um, inter web space. So it starts giving supply to the opponents and then flexor and then abductor. So if the patient can abduct against resistance and if patient can abduct that means the abductor is functioning well and that tells that your these three muscles are functioning well because if the abductor is functioning well the chances are the other two are functioning well as well and the same thing in um, hypothenar muscles. So you should check all these muscles and once you check you have now checked all the extrinsics as well as intrinsics of the hand. So now once you have examined the flexors, now move on to the extensors. The extensor tendon is uh, extensor disti, um, distorum communis. So it starts as a common muscle belly and then divides into four. So it crosses the metacarpal, uh, sorry, the wrist joint, metacarpophalangeal joint, and then later on it does go over the um, proximity little joint in form of central slip and then subsequently it attaches towards the base of uh, the distal phalanx. Now how to examine the extensor distorum communis. Now in order to check the function of the extensors are uh, to extend of course the wrist uh, the me and metacarpophalangeal joint and interphalangeal joint. Now the extension function is extremely important because if you have to grasp something until and unless you can extend, you will not be able to grasp. So for grasping purpose, extension is extremely important. Now, if you want to assess the extensor distorum communis, now as I said, it will extend the metacarpophalangeal joint, but it will also extend the proximal interphalangeal as well as distant interphalangeal joint. But as you would have heard few minutes ago when I was talking about our intrinsics of the hand, they, they can also cause extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint and distant interphalangeal joint. So how do you differentiate it? The only difference is that when you have intrinsics, intrinsic with flex the metacarpophalangeal joint, however, our extensors will extend. So if you keep the hand extended onto the flat surface, you are eliminating actions of the intrinsic. So if I want to check my extensor distorum communis, all I need to ask is to lift the finger up. As I said, the movement is almost 40 degrees of hyperextension. So if I show here, so if this is the flat surface, you can see I am able to extend. Now this action can only be done by extensor distorum communis. So this is how you would test it. But as you know, nature always poses challenges. So things are not so straightforward because now you have got separate extensors for index finger and separate extensor for uh, little finger as well. So you have extensor indices proprius and extensor distae quintui, which are independent muscles and are responsible for extension of um, the index as well as little finger. So how do we assess the movement of these two thing, uh, two um, separate uh, muscles which are independent? Now, if you want to test them separately, then the only way to do it is to eliminate the action of EDC. So how do you do it? So make a fist and then uh, extend the wrist. So now you are holding the EDC. So EDC cannot move. So if I now ask you to lift the index finger, you will still be able to do it and that tells that extensor indices proprius or extensor 
indices for this index finger is still working. So, if somebody can extend despite holding all these three fingers together flexed, that means it is working. And similarly, for little finger, you can still do it. However, if I hold everything, so if if patient is able to do this, that means these two tendons which are separate are also functioning well. Now there are three other important extrinsic uh, extensor tendons which are important, which I have not covered and they form the anatomical snuff box is one is the extensor pollicis longus and the other two are abductor pollicis uh, brevis and uh, sorry abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Now these two tendons, how do you assess these three? So if I can just ask you to just hitchhike, just put up and then feel the bow stringing, you will feel two tendons here and one tendon here. That means that these two are functioning well because one of them attaches at the base of the metacarpal and another attaches at the um, metacarpophalangeal joint. So hitchhike, do this, feel for these two tendons, they're fine. Now, how do you test extensor pollicis longus? Now, extensor pollicis longus is the only muscle which is responsible for retropulsion. So retropulsion means if I am able to lift my thumb up from a flat surface, see, just keep your focus here. You will see these tendon becoming prominent. So if I am able to retropulse, then you will see this intact tendon. So that will cover the extensors of the hand. So now we have covered um, how to test um, the flexors and extensors of the hand. Uh, we also talked about the small muscles or the intrinsics of the hand. Now the next condition that I would like to move on which is also related to one of these muscles or a group of muscles is called intrinsic tightness. So what is intrinsic tightness and how do you diagnose intrinsic tightness? Now intrinsic tightness um, as the word itself means that your intrinsics are tight. Um, that means they will be uh, functioning more than their usual and as you know, um, previously I said the function of intrinsic is this. So what intrinsic does is they cause flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension at uh, the, these small joints. Now due to um, neurological injury uh, or due to scarring after a trauma, your intrinsics can become tight. Now if you look at the flexion of proximal interphalangeal joint, if I show you flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint, in different degrees of metacarpophalangeal joint flexion, if you see here, it's same. It is not affected by position of metacarpophalangeal joint. So the flexion remains same irrespective of what is the position of metacarpophalangeal joint. Now this is normal. So in a normal patient, flexion at interphalangeal joint will remain same irrespective of flexion uh, what is present at metacarpophalangeal joint. So now the test that we used to diagnose intrinsic tightness is called uh, Bunnell's test. Now what we do in Bunnell's test is we check for flexion of uh, interphalangeal joint uh, with MCP flexed. When MCP is flexed in intrinsic tightness, you will be able to flex the fingers at interphalangeal joint. However, if the same finger, the flexion is checked after extension because once you extend, it is becoming more tighter when you flex proximal interphalangeal joint, it will not flex and it will flex much less. So this is a positive test that is suggestive of a tight intrinsics. So just to repeat again, when you flex it, you will be able to bend IPJ easily or it will bend more. When you extend metacarpophalangeal joint, you will struggle. Now opposite of uh, intrinsic tightness is extrinsic tightness. So if there is uh, scarring or shortening of the long extensors, um, then it will just be opposite to what you see. So now just imagine these extensors are tight. If these extensors are tight and then if you are extending the metacarpophalangeal joint and what it is doing it, it is just relaxing the extensors slightly. So when it is extend, ex uh, relaxing the extensors slightly, 
in this position the ipj in this situation will bend more however if the extrinsic is already tight and if i am flexing the metacarpophalangeal joint what it does is it is tightening this even more and in this position i will not be able to flex the proximal interphalangeal joint so it is just opposite so if in extrinsic tightness in extension of metacarpophalangeal joint you will have more flexion as you flex it you will have less flexion at uh, proximal interphalangeal joint so this is extrinsic tightness so now the other uh, uncommon or relatively rare condition i would like to discuss is uh, which is a call a lumbrical plus uh, finger so i'll talk about what is lumbrical plus finger and what you will see clinically and how will you diagnose it clinically so lumbrical plus uh, is a clinical condition which is usually due to disruption of flexor distorum profundus and distal to the origin of lumbricals so the disruption of ftp tendon will happen once the lumbricals uh, have originated and as we talked before they originate from the radial side so any disruption secondary uh, or later after the origin will lead to lumbrical plus uh, uh, finger and this can be seen in distal transaction of fdp whether there is any avulsion you can see it in distant uh, interphalangeal joint amputation or amputation through the middle phalanx or sometimes if you have uh, put a graft uh, and the graft is uh, too long so in these conditions you will see lumbrical plus so what you will see clinically in a lumbrical plus finger so lumbrical plus uh, finger is a rare uh, diagnosis and uh, i must confess that in my um, long orthopedic career of roughly 20 years i have not seen uh, a patient of lumbrical plus finger um, however what you will see is uh, that once you try to flex the interphalangeal joint there will be paradoxical extension of the interphalangeal joint of the extended finger so if i am trying to flex my finger this will paradoxically extend so when i'm trying to flex it say for example there is a tendon cut in the middle finger i try to flex my hand but this will go in paradoxical extension and this is because the lumbrical will pull the lateral bands and what it does is as they pull the lateral bands it causes the paradoxical extension of um, the interphalangeal joint proximal interphalangeal joint and because um, of the on there is no action of uh, flexor distorum profundus distally so paradoxical extension when you are trying to bend the ipj is characterized in lumbrical plus finger now uh, moving on to our next uh, condition in continuity with the various uh, pathologies that i've already talked to make it more complex we'll talk about intrinsic minus hand or in uh, a layman terms you can also uh, call it as a claw hand and this is usually due to a uh, weakness of intrinsic so as it is intrinsic minus means your intrinsics are weak or you have got strong extrinsic so if you got strong extensor that will lead to a clinical condition which is called claw hand now you will see these conditions especially uh, if there is involvement of uh, ulnar nerve you can see it also involvement of median nerve or sometimes involvement of both uh, other conditions that you will uh, see is if there is any issue with the brain sometimes in people with stroke if there is a disbalance uh, between extrinsics and intrinsics and if intrinsic becomes weak this is uh, leads to a claw hand or intrinsic minus hand so if you see here in intrinsic minus hand we talked about um, the deformities so if you see in intrinsic minus hand extrinsics are strong so there is extension at metacarpophalangeal joint so there is extension of metacarpophalangeal joint now intrinsics are responsible for keeping these two joint straight now because intrinsics are weak and extrinsics are overpowering then what it does is there is uh, a flexion of both proximal as well as distant phalangeal joint so this leads to a clinical condition where you will see clawing so this is a position of a typical intrinsic minus hand so now let's move on to our next condition uh, i think most of the orthopedic surgeons would have heard uh, an effect which is called quadragia effect 
So now let's uh, talk about quadrature effect. Now quadrature effect is usually because as we said before that FTP has a common muscle belly. So they work as a team. So if one of the team member is affected, the other will be affected as well. So if FDP is uh, stuck down or there is an adhesion or there is a decreased excursion of FTP, then it will lead uh, to quadrature effect. And to talk about it, uh, I will show you in my hand. So as I said, uh, quadrature effect is usually seen due to scarring or adhesion of the uh, FDP tendon. Also, if there is a, a greater than a one centimeter advancement of the FDP tendon, uh, in case it is injured. Now, as I said, they all work as a team. So if one is affected, then others will be affected too. Now, for any reason, say for example, if the FDP of the middle finger is, there is adhesion and it is not able to bend properly. Now, the excursion of the rest of the tendon is pretty much dependent upon the excursion of the uh, fingers which has got the shortest excursion. So if one finger has reached its maximum excursion, then that will act as a limiting factor for other fingers. So what I mean by that is because of scarring, if I'm able to bend, because as you know, it crosses MCPJ, IPJ, as well as uh, DIPJ. For any reason, if I'm able to bend my middle finger due to, due to uh, scarring, then for me to bend the rest of the finger completely is next to impossible. So this is quadrature effect and this leads to the weakness of the hand grip. And that is the reason we talk so much about being aggressive with physiotherapy to get the full range of movement. Because if one finger uh, gets stuck and if our one finger doesn't have a full range of movement and because of it uh, there is excursion, a decrease in excursion of the other uh, fingers, um, then it leads to weakness. So just talk about again, if for any reason, if I'm able to bend this finger due to uh, scarring or adhesion, only this much, there is no way I will be able to make a full grip. You can try it. You can try it until unless this comes completely within um, or reaches its maximum excursion, the rest of the fingers are also limited. This is quadrature effect. So now we have covered uh, a lot of areas which uh, confuses uh, surgeons and other practicing doctors and physiotherapists. I have tried to cover that earlier so that uh, you can uh, eliminate your confusion. It brings some clarity to your thought. Now let's cover some uh, easy topics. And the first one I would like to talk about is trigger finger. Now as um, the name suggests, you will notice triggering. So the patient will report uh, catching, clicking, or sometimes patient will be able to bend the finger and as it extends, you will hear they will report clicking. When it gets worse, sometimes they are able to bend it, but when extending, they have to use the other hand to extend it. In later stages, this can remain flexed and even if you try, it doesn't extend. So how to uh, diagnose a trigger finger? Uh, it's extremely easy. Uh, if I show you in my hand, so trigger finger you will diagnose purely on history and the patient reports as a typical history of clicking and it can affect anything, all the fingers can be affected um, and it's usually more common in uh, diabetics and diabetics you will see it to be affecting more than one digit and sometimes bilateral as well. Now, how do you locate A1 pulley? A1 pulley if you draw a distance from here to here and the same distance from here to here is usually where the A1 pulley is. So if you feel, say for example, if the patient has got triggering of the middle finger, as you press across this region, he will or she will report pain and discomfort. Also, you will feel it's thicker and you can have a nodular feeling in that region. And if you put your hand there and ask them to extend, Sometimes when you ask them to flex or extend, if you see catching, that is a giveaway sign. So in earlier stages, just pain and tenderness in this region can be, uh, is more than enough for you to diagnose a trigger finger. Similarly in thumb, if you have pain and tenderness across the metacarpophalangeal joint, um, that is where the pulley is. 
and you will uh, feel tenderness and a nodular feeling and that would suggest that the patient might have trigger thumb. So now let's move on to another uh, easy clinical condition to diagnose uh, which is called Deputin's uh, disease. So Deputin's disease is a fibroproliferative disorder which is uh, which involves the palmar fascia. Now, now the history is quite typical. A patient will usually give a, a long history of uh, um, swelling and pitting of the skin which is associated with uh, deformities um, of the fingers. Now they can be unilateral, they can be bilateral and they can affect other parts of body such as feet or a penis in, in males. So you should be mindful and you should look for uh, other sites as well. Now how to diagnose it? It's uh, very easy and uh, let's cover um, that now. So now the characteristic finding that you would see uh, when you look on the palmer side is you will see nodules. You will see pitting. If you see small holes, that is because skin is being pulled by um, the palmar fascia, which is being uh, contracted. So if you see pitting and swelling, and you will see cords. If you can see these cords in this region, then um, that is a giveaway sign for Deputin's disease. Now you have to feel uh, for uh, the different uh, cords that you see, like spiral cord here, in between fingers, if you feel here, Sometimes you will feel knitted records, which is responsible for reduction deformity. Rarely, in aggressive disease, if you put your hand in this area, if you feel something like a uh, bowstring, that is commissural cord. And that suggests, uh, if there is radial involvement, usually suggests that disease is more uh, aggressive in these patients. So if you have cords, if you have swelling, and on simultaneously, of course, you will have deformity. The deformity, can usually involve metacarbophalangeal joint. Any later stages can involve proximate phalangeal joint. In certain group of patients, uh, the proximate phalangeal joint can also be affected at an early stage. Now, in back of the hand, you will see Garrett's paths. If you see Garrett's path, uh, then that is also suggestive of uh, Deputin's disease. So now, as I said, you will have deformity involving metacarbophalangeal joint and proximate phalangeal joint. Now, how do you assess the deformity? Now, a lot of people find it quite uh, difficulty in assessing the deformity. Now, see, for example, if there was a deformity of, there was a flexion deformity of proximate phalangeal joint. Now, if I want to assess the deformity of proximate phalangeal joint, what you need to do is, you just need to flex the metacarpophalangeal joint. And you will see a lot of times, as you flex it, this will become straight. That tells that there is no flexion deformity of the proximate phalangeal joint. However, if you flex it and still it remains like this, then that will tell that yes, there is flexion deformity. But I can guarantee you a lot of times when you flex it, you will see this is becoming straight, suggestive that it is not involving the proximate phalangeal joint. Now, how to assess the deformity at the metacarpophalangeal joint? So when, as I said, when you are assessing PIPJ, you need to flex the MCPJ. When you are trying to assess the deformity of MCPJ, you need to flex the PIPJ. So now I have flexed it and then I will take it front and back. Now because this is a normal patient, you will be able to extend up to 90 degrees. So you can see this is almost 90 degrees. In early part of the career, a lot of trainee doctors and uh, doctors who are training, they will uh, be able to extend it up to here and they will say, okay, um, now it is extending up to say around uh, minus 30 degrees, so there is no deformity. No, that's not true. You can extend this up to 90 degrees. So even if, even after uh, passive extension, if you are coming up to here, that means still there is a loss of 70 degrees in this particular joint. So you will individually assess each joints which are affected. Now the one common thing that patient will ask or which patient which uh, might help you in making a decision whether to operate or not is called a tabletop test. So in tabletop test is a very simple test. You ask the patient to put hand flat. If the patient can put hand flat on the table, that means the deformity is little and it is correctable. And in those cases, you don't need to operate. So again, 
if I can put my hand flat on the table and that would suggest it's a negative test. That means you can treat it with non-operative methods, but do warn the patient that if deformity uh, worsens to come back and revisit you. Now, one common thing that might confuse you is how to differentiate between somebody who has got deputrins or somebody who has got claw hand. Now, in claw hand, as I said, it's an intrinsic minus condition. So, there will be extension of metacarpophalangeal joint and flexion of proximative phalangeal joint. In deputrins disease, there is always flexion of metacarpophalangeal joint and associated flexion of proximative phalangeal joint if there is deformity of proximative phalangeal joint. So, this is the only way to uh, differentiate. So, MCPJ extended in intrinsic minus or claw hand and MCPJ flexed in um, other conditions which are not a claw hand and a deputrins is one of them. So, let us not talk about uh, uh, keeping on to the theme of contractures. Now, contracture of a proximative phalangeal joint leading to uh, a flexion deformity of uh, proximative phalangeal joint after trauma. Now, hand, as I said, is uh, such a versatile organ that you use it for your day-to-day -day activities and that makes it more prone for injuries. So, if there is any uh, injury to the proximal phalangeal joint and if there is contracture of the ligaments and the volar plate, that would lead to a flexion deformity of proximal phalangeal joint. Now, the characteristic finding of a PIPJ contracture due to injury uh, is uh, that there will be uh, restriction of both active and flex, uh, passive movement. So, it is not just that patient cannot move it. Even if you want to move it, there will be no change in range of movement. So, that is the first giveaway that active and passive movement are pretty same. And also, the second thing is that the PIP movement is not related in any ways to the position of MCPJ. In normal hand, you can flex it to any degrees irrespective of position of uh, MCPJ. In a contracture as well, irrespective of position of MCPJ, the range of movement in the proximal interphalangeal joint will remain the same. So, if the range is remaining the same, then it is suggestive of post-traumatic uh, contracture of PIPJ. So, now let us move on to the ligamentous injury uh, which is called uh, gamekeeper's thumb. Now, gamekeeper's thumb is injury to um, the ulnar collateral ligament of metacarpophalangeal uh, joint of thumb. Now, um, I have made a separate video uh, which is purely uh, based on uh, what to examine and how to um, diagnose this on a patient which had an uh, injury. So, uh, let us talk about it in brief. So, you have two uh, sets of uh, ligaments. One is the accessory collateral ligament and one is the proper ulnar collateral ligament and then you have volar plate as well. Now, if, if you want to uh, do an examination for um, a gamekeeper's thumb, which is usually acute uh, due to trauma, uh, occasionally it can be chronic nature, uh, what you need to do is you need to assess the thumb both in uh, extension as well as in 30 degree of flexion. So, now there are uh, two sets of uh, collateral ligament. As I said, as accessory collateral ligament, um, it provides uh, some stability with uh, metacarpophalangeal joint in extension, the proper ulnar collateral ligament in 30 degree of flexion. Now, if there is injury to only proper ulnar collateral ligament, the thumb, the pinch can still be a stable pinch uh, despite injuring uh, the ulnar uh, collateral ligament. However, if you do a valgus force and this is opening even in extension, then that is a really bad news because that tells that not even the proper collateral ligament but also accessory, also possibly the volar plate is also gone. But if you want to assess or examine um, the ulnar collateral ligament, then if I show you in my thumb, you need to bend it around 30 degrees. Once you bend the uh, MCP joint to 30 degrees, what it does is it unlocks the joint and then you apply um, a valgus force and if there is pain or there is uh, tenderness or if there is opening that would suggest that the ulna collateral ligament is gone and that would be suggestive of a gameskeeper thumb.
So now let's move on and talk about the deformities. I think the three deformities that I would like to talk about is uh, the swan neck deformity that I showed you earlier in the video, the boutonniere's deformity and the mallet deformity. So let's talk about uh, the boutonniere's deformity first. Now, as I said, usually boutonniere's deformity after trauma is seen due to injury to the central slip. Now, a lot of orthopedic surgeons take injury to the soft tissue uh, injury across the proximal interphalangeal joint quite lightly and I've seen that body strapping or some form of immobilization uh, is the usual prescription. However, uh, occasionally uh, you will get your hands burned and a patient with central slip injury will later on come and manifest itself in the form of a boutonniere's deformity. Now I've already uploaded a separate video purely focusing on Elsen test as how to interpret it. But uh, just to make this video complete, we'll uh, cover it again briefly. So now Elsen test is an extremely useful test for diagnosing central slip injury. So for do you to do the Elsen test, put hand flat on the edge of the table so that proximal interphalangeal joint um, can be bent up to 90 degrees. So once the fingers are bent, uh, before uh, doing this test, if you have swelling or bruising on the dorsum, that will suggest that there is uh, there may be injury to uh, the central slip. So for Elsen test, you put a finger across the middle phalanx and you ask the patient to extend. If the patient can extend, because that is the function of uh, the central slip and the distant phalangeal joint is floppy, then that is a negative test suggesting that your uh, central slip is intact. However, if the central slip is gone, what will happen is as they extend, there will be weakness and there will be paradoxical extension of distant phalangeal joint. I think do refer to the um, separate video that I have uploaded if this is not clear here. So the second deformity that we talked about, swan neck deformity, was where there was extension of the proximal phalangeal joint and there was flexion of distant phalangeal joint. And this is purely... Uh, usually due to injury to the volar plate. So volar plate is a very important structure which is present across the volar aspect and it is responsible for uh, providing stability and preventing uh, uh, hyperextension at the proximal interphalangeal joint. So if this is weak or this is gone, what happens is the extensors, they overpower and there is compensatory hyperextension uh, of the proximal interphalangeal joint and flexion of distant phalangeal joint. So now in terms of management, I forgot to talk about the management of the boutonniere's deformity. Uh, if uh, you are treating a boutonniere's deformity, then if you think the central slip is gone, and if you have any doubts, then put them in boutonniere's splint. So boutonniere's splint is uh, something, uh, it's a splint which keeps the hand and keeps the uh, finger in extended position. And this is the position in which it will heal. So Google boutonniere splint and you will see this is how the position I will usually keep it for around uh, six weeks if it is a soft tissue Elson and then progressively get it uh, mobilizing. So no body strapping boutonniere splint. If you are talking about swan neck deformity and if you're worried about a volar plate injury, whether it's a bony volar plate or whether it's a soft tissue volar plate, what you do is an extension block splint. So patient can flex but cannot extend. So keep it immobilized for roughly around three weeks and after that, get it going. You don't want to be immobilizing more than three weeks uh, because then that leads to uh, capsular contracture and then you will have PIPJ contracture, which I talked uh, in this video a while ago. So last deformity that I would talk about is uh, a mallet deformity. Again, as I said, uh, there is a flexion deformity of the distant phalangeal joint and this is due to either um, extensor tendon being injured or becoming stretched or there is a bony evolution. These are the usually three common uh, things that will happen and it's very easy to diagnose. There's a typical history and a deformity which in initial stages is passively correctable. So all I do for soft tissue mallet injury, I will keep the finger in mallet splint for around six weeks 24-7. That is uh, you are wearing it day and night and after six weeks I will keep them uh, for night time only for further six weeks. Uh, if it's a bony injury, uh, it heals quite quick. So I'll keep them in uh, mallet splint for roughly around three weeks. And after three weeks, I'll get them going. So now let's move on to some nerve pathologies uh, such as uh, carpal tunnels or cubital tunnel. 
So carpal tunnel, uh, there is compression of median nerve at the wrist and patient will typically give history of uh, pins and needles, especially during the night times. Uh, patient might wake up in the morning with numb fingers and uh, any repeated activity during the day can lead to numbness. In later stages, when they start to experience uh, weakness, then uh, they will uh, uh, report uh, dropping things. So they think they are holding something, but they'll start dropping things. Now, how to diagnose it? I think majority of the times, uh, it is very straightforward. Um, if the patient is not having any neck pain and has got these typical night symptoms, then it's usually carpal tunnel. Now, how, how to diagnose it? Uh, there are two or three things, and let's talk, talk it about now. So if uh, you want to diagnose uh, carpal tunnel, then uh, first thing, you, as you would do for any you know, look, I look for any particular wasting. So the first thing that gets wasted is abductor pollicis brevis. So now this is the area that will start to become hollow. Now, occasionally mild weakness or mild wasting uh, is um, very hard to detect. However, if you put your hand in this position and then a mild uh, wasting of even thinar muscles could be appreciated. So if there is any wasting, that will suggest that it is, uh, um, maybe it is carpal tunnel. Now, you also check the sensation on the median nerve distribution. So, if you feel for sensation of the thumb, um, mid, uh, index finger, uh, middle finger, and the radial side of the ring finger, these are the three and a half fingers where patient would usually uh, complain of hypostasia. Um, if you have hypostasia in this area, that is also complain, that is also indicative that it might be carpal tunnel. Now, I will take this opportunity to talk about if somebody has got a, say for example, C5, C6 disc, and how do you uh, differentiate it from carpal tunnel? And occasionally you can have double crush, so it can be quite difficult. Now, hypostasia in carpal tunnel will only affect the tip of the fingers. This area across the thena eminence, which is supplied by palmar cutaneous branch, which originates and goes on top of the carpal tunnel, will be normal. So, however, you know, outer aspect of the forearm is C6. So, if there is a problem with the whole C6 region, you will have hypostasia, not only here or in the fingers, but proximally as well. And same way, you will have wasting proximally as well. So, if you have wasting proximally, and if you have altered sensation uh, proximally, then think of uh, cervical spine, not carpal tunnel. So the one muscle that I would like to test in uh, somebody with carpal tunnel is to check the power of abductor pulses brevis. So um, we have talked about uh, how to test it uh, before. So I will ask patient to bring his thumb to the my index finger and push against it. And this is firing very well. So good strength. Um, checking the power of abductor pulses brevis is of uh, extreme importance in patient with carpal tunnel. Now. To do the tunnel sign, as there is a median nerve is a compressive neuropathy of median nerve at carpal tunnel, we just do some gentle taps. And if the patient reports the electric sensation or reproduction of the uh, patient symptoms, then that is a positive sign, uh, which is suggestive of carpal uh, tunnel syndrome. Now, the one test that I would like to talk about is a phalanx test, and I'll show you how I do it. So now the Typically, phalanx test is being described that you keep your hands in this particular position and you wait for around 30 seconds for uh, uh, see if the patient has got reproduction of his symptoms. Now, the sooner the hands uh, starts to tingle, I think uh, more severe the carpal tunnel is. However, I do my test slightly differently. So, what I, what I do is I just ask, keep the elbow extended and then I flex the wrist uh, like this and I'll wait for around 30 seconds and I'll do it in both the hands. So one hand acts as a control or if patient has got bilateral uh, symptoms, then it, you will see this patient is having a reproduction of symptoms in uh, typically involving the radial three fingers. However, there are occasions, uh, you may have atypical findings that some patients will report some uh, altered sensation is little and ring finger. Uh, they may have a simultaneous uh, ulnar pathology or most likely it is due to abnormal uh, connections uh, in between the median and ulnar nerve 
what we call Martin Gruber and osteomosis. So don't get thrown away in if certain patients where your typical symptoms of carpal tunnel are there, but if they have atypical distribution, that can be due to uh, Martin Gruber and osteomosis. So I have already covered cubital tunnel syndrome um, in my elbow examination. It is very rare for a uh, nerve to be compressed uh, um, in across the wrist. However, if it is, um, then you will have wasting of uh, hypothenar uh, muscles and you will have altered sensations in uh, the little and um, ulnar aspect of the uh, ring finger. Now, if uh, you have got wasting of hypothenar muscles, if you have wasting of first dorsal interosei, if you have got guttering of uh, in between the metacarpals, and if you have got a positive tunnel, as I have shown you, that is because of cubital tunnel. So uh, you may have problem uh, in the elbow, but you may have manifestation in the hand. So be mindful of it. So now let's talk about some hand infections. So infection of the hand uh, is uh, uncommon, but can happen after uh, penetrating injury. And sometimes uh, it is not associated with uh, penetrating injury. So let's first talk about uh, if you have synovial sheath infection of the fingers, how to uh, diagnose them and how do they manifest. So if there is uh, a patient who comes to you with some pain, swelling and redness, uh, and difficulty in moving the fingers, then you should think of uh, an infection of the flexor sheath. Now, if you talk about uh, the individual fingers, um, then uh, you will normally see uh, what we call, you look for the signs of cannibal, that is you will, the finger will become more swollen, you will have a fusiform swelling. Uh, also, um, finger will be in slightly flexed position because that's it, that is the position of comfort. And if you try to do passive extension, the patient will not like it and will complain of a lot of pain. A percussion across the flexor sheet, if it even gentle percussion, uh, will be extremely painful. So if you have got uh, these three, uh, or sorry, four signs, um, then you should think of a flexor sheet infection and it is uh, an emergency from if you have a few of the very uh, rare orthopedic emergencies which uh, should be dealt uh, even uh, in midnight. So other uncommon um, infection that you will see will be uh, infection of the thinar space, hypothenar space or the mid palmar space. I would not uh, go into the um, deep into anatomy that which uh, sheath is connected uh, uh, with uh, which space. But in essence, if you have got uh, redness, if you have got swelling, if you have got pain, if patient is uh, pyrexial, a patient is unable to move on the hand, and there is a lot of uh, uh, swelling, tenderness, then that is a giveaway sign for infection. It's not a difficult uh, condition to diagnose. Um, so these uh, typical red flag for any other infection are also present in the hand. So if you are uh, keep that in mind, you will be you will be easily able to diagnose uh, these hand infections. And again, as I said, uh, this for me is an emergency and should be addressed as soon as. So uh, the last part uh, covering infection, I would talk about paronychial infection. So that is infection you will see across the nail fold. It can be, it will present as swelling and pain and are very easy to diagnose. Occasionally you will have infection of the pulp space. So if this is too swollen and if you lose uh, the, the, these uh, ridges which are present in the finger and if it is very tender to touch and extremely swollen, that can uh, suggest that it is infection of the pulse space and again it may require uh, surgical intervention. So last thing I think which I have not covered are the deformities uh, of the hand uh, which are present in rheumatoid. I think that itself is a very vast topic and it will take me uh, at least half an hour to cover that which will make this video very long but uh, if I have a patient of rheumatoid I will probably talk just about rheumatoid hand in a separate video. Uh, viewers, this was a extremely elaborate video on how to do a hand examination. I have made an attempt to make it as uh, comprehensive as possible and as easy as possible uh, to remove uh, any confusion that you have. I hope after watching this video, it will make you uh, more confident in doing hand examination. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up, do subscribe and do share our channel. Thank you.